Leaven. 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 Distinction, sporos, and sperma. Distinction. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's, um, let's pray, and we'll get started in our lesson for today is our reflections from last year. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this time opportunity we have today. Thank you for uh, bringing us through another year of, of your provision and your love and your restoration to our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits. Keep us steadfast all the more as we see your day approaching. We think that you, um, thank you for all the things that you have done in our lives and continue to do in our heart, mind, soul, and spirit. We thank you for just your forgiveness. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for just uh, restoration when we have experienced a failure and fallen short on things that we know we could do better. And we thank you just continuing to encourage us, remind us that uh, each moment opportunity we have to be just restored by you and just to be uh, picked up again and that we may fall, that we get up again and continue that walk of faith and belief that you are there as our loving and caring Heavenly Father. Thank you that that day coming out ahead that you want us to look forward to. We ask you to keep us, find us watchful and, and, and ready for that day. So we thank you for all you do and for all you continue to, to do and have done and will yet do in our lives as until that day comes. So we ask you now we look to these reflections. Remind us and keep us in this sense of spirit of appreciation and gratitude as we remind ourselves of what you've already given to us and look forward to what is unfolding to us for the year to come and the years to come as well. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. You okay, babe? Oh, no. Okay. So a couple of the uh, references for today, just so you remember, today is Communion Sunday. So if you don't have your elements, get your elements ready for communion. We're doing that today, the first Sunday. Also, this Friday will be our Q&A, so we'll do question and answers on this Friday coming up. We're back to doing our Fridays again. That'll be our Q&A starting up on this Friday. And also, um, lastly, we're going to, the lesson for today, um, I should say lastly, but <laughs> um, poignantly, the lesson for today is going to be on the New Year's, New Year's Reflections and to remind ourselves of why we do this. Why, why, do, why do we do this? For many reasons. One, if you don't take time to reflect, then you, you forget, right? And if you forget, that's not a good reference to giving God thanks and gratitude. You can't be thankful and grateful if you don't know what you're grateful and thankful for. More specifically speaking, it helps to be more specific in giving your gratitude and thanks to God for what he has already given. To say to God, for example, thank you, God, for the air in my lungs. Okay, and what about that? You know, and what about that are you thankful for? That we were a lump of clay that he picked up and breathed from his spirit into us, his the breath of life who became a living soul. I mean, that, just imagine that. We were inanimate. There was no free will involved. No clay said, ooh, me first, me first. No, none of that happened. It was just God on his own, in his own intonation, uh, doing everything that was necessary to bring us alive, which is why Book of Acts says, in him we, leave, we live and breathe and have our being. So the first thing we do is we do it because we want to reflect on being grateful and thankful more specifically for what God's given. Second reason we do it, biblically speaking, that's from a reasonable, sta reasonable standpoint of common sense, but biblically speaking, the Jewish people in Rosh Hashanah, if you remember, on their new year, which again, even though it's in April, it's their calendar starting of their new year, they, in the Sun, March, April, they actually celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the new year, and the feast of the, of the trumpet, which is in September. So they would celebrate this and say, well, you have to be appreciative for what God has done in your life, good and bad, and they would reflect back on everything that God has done, and they would actually give thanks for all things good and bad, righteous and wicked, holy and evil, that they experienced in their life because of the re remembrance that they had of Mount Gerizim, where the good and blessings were, were announced, and Mount Ebal, where the evil cursings were announced, and they go, wow, God did that. He sanctioned that to remind us to always take accord and have an account of gratitude and thankfulness regardless of what we experienced, good, evil or good, righteous or wickedness, either way, we are to be thankful in all things because a loving, heavenly, sovereign, awesome Father is behind all that, orchestrating that for our benefit. And, and that's what he's saying. And they even went a step further to say that if you didn't do that and give thanks for the bad of the evil, the wicked things you experienced in your life, then you weren't even qualified or you weren't even worthy of participating in Yom Kippur which is a big deal, because that means your sins weren't being pushed forward, which means you retained them. That would be an awful state to be in. Imagine if we still instituted that today. If Jesus said, oh, by the way, your salvation is being uh, withheld from you for one year until you, what? That'd be crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, you imagine that. I mean. Does any of that go on in the millennium? No, no, but I think it's just, it, it's yes and no. So no. So Brother Todd asked me a question. He said to me, 
in, in the heavenlies when people are evicted out, you know, kicked out like the, the foolish virgin person. So, but wait a minute, if they're in a body where there's no sin, how did they have sin and, and they fell out? It's not so much that they sinned, it's that they, they, didn't, they didn't bring the prerequisite character and or, or therefore a resource to be able to fulfill God's demands. The extra measure of oil, for example. So because they presumed upon God, the four unique parable chart, they fell short of not having that resource that then was exposed when God says, hey, where's the extra garment? That, what you mean extra garment? So it, it looks like I'm saying, well, they, they fell into sin. Well, they didn't do what God wanted them to do because they were not aware of what God was wanting them to do. So they were ignorant to a, to a requirement that then was looked upon by them to not be found with their, um, un un unfortunately, with their end reality when they go through the day of inspection and then they're done. And so it's, it's so the same way is, so in that vein of the millennium, does this understanding of the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur take place? No, not in that not exact way, but in principle it does in the sense that we're supposed to have a reflective mindset that if our king and our sovereign is still working, why shouldn't we work? If he's still yet to be fulfilling all the things he's supposed to be fulfilling, why would we think that we have a right to presume and kind of relax? What, what makes us think that? And so it's the same concept of if we're looking forward to the day in which he ascends to his throne of glory in the heavens, and he's not there yet because he's ruling on the throne of his father David, he's reigning, he's reigning from both, uh, he's ruling from both, excuse me, but he's reigning on earth, he's ruling both heaven and earth, but he's reigning on the throne of his father David on earth to fulfill the prophecy as the king of Israel. Well then, if he's doing his functionality, what would make us think that we don't have a job to do? At what, at what point did you forget John 13, that a servant is never greater than his master? So if you actually think that, he, that he's, he's busy washing feet while you're just relaxed in the corner, washing no one's feet, that makes no sense. You know, if he's washing feet, then you should wash feet. If he's working, you should work. It doesn't make any sense that he should be working and you're going, boy, this vacation is awesome. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. So and if he's washing feet, if you just sit back and go, no, I'm not doing nothing. I, I, that's, but he said, do likewise. So we're always supposed to follow him as our example. It's funny, we're getting some. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be a rod of iron during the entire millennial reign. So, so the principle of that would be true, yes, but the actual reality of people doing that, no. But I think the principle they should take with them is understanding this, which we, we've been talking about some of that through the ministry through the years. So, again, I mentioned the gratitude and thankfulness are the specific blessings God has given us while we do the reflections. And also because of the Jewish idiom of how they would culturally look back on Rosh Hashanah and they would look back and reflect and embrace the both, whether it's wickedly experienced or awesomely righteously experienced. Either way, they'd see God's hand in using that for their betterment and as a God, as a sovereign father who loves them. And they realize that without doing so, they would have no right to presume upon God a new year of a walk of faith that be, would begin on the right foot. To begin on the right foot, you have to be an acceptance of all things that he has done in your life. So that's why we do these reflections, to, to look back and to see um, where God's hand has been and our lives specific to the teachings that he's given. So the first thing we saw <coughs> was in the book of Colossians. And I have my notes I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat with. So in the book of Colossians, we, we first we read from, we, we studied this. Then we had the epistle of James, the first, second epistles of Peter, first, second, and third epistles of John. We had the Bible conference with three accounts of Jesus and demon-possessed men, Psalm 139, Matthew 13, Luke 13, and then the Christ timeline and ministry. I'll add more to that in a little bit. That's why that has some more space down there. So on the book of Colossians, what we found, if you remember, was <laughs> it, its, its location to Laodicea was not too far. It was a main trading route, and because of its location geographically, it made more sense in how the people of Laodicea could be so pompous and so uh, miss, missing the mark that we read later on about in, this, in the seven church letters in Revelation. It kind of always is a mystery. I mean, if you don't know the backstory, you go, oh, okay, they're close to Colossae. He was a people of faithful ones, which obviously Laodicea was right there. So in Colossae, as we saw, the, the main message I, we, we talk about here is not lost. Well, so there's many messages we, we talked about. I'm just going to put some highlights. But he talked about remaining steadfast in the book of Colossians. He also, we, we saw this, uh, this ton, whoops, I'm going to put it like this. This ton okinomion, 
I'm just going to highlight certain things. I'm not, there's no way I'm going to restudy everything again. There's not enough time in a, in a day to do that. So that's, that's the stewardship. of the anear of sperma. So that was his main, his main focus in Colossians was to remain steadfast because we just don't have a stewardship. The idea is when you're at the 30 and the 60 and the 100, you change in your prerequisites of what God has given you as a stewardship of the mysteries. So your stewardship of the mysteries becomes greater the more that you are, are given understanding of who he is and what his word says. Makes sense, right? So it's just like anything else. In other words, if, if, if you are representing him as a private in the army versus a three-star or, or, or a lieutenant or a colonel or a four-star general, obviously the culpability changes because people look more to you and more is at stake and more collateral damage can ensue, right? Or benefits can be given because of how you have fulfilled your role. So what he's saying is the stewardship is what matters, ton okonomion, because the stewardship of Aeneas is what we're all looking to be aiming for, and he's looking at and telling us that we have a stewardship. Remember to remain steadfast, no matter where you are in your understanding, remain steadfast. But all the more so, the more you grow, the more your stewardship grows as well. And understand that there's an accountability with that, because there's a blessing of inheritance. It doesn't come for free. So, so he's letting you know. Then he, then he goes on, if you remember, and he, and he talks about another highlight. He mentioned also, he, he mentioned, uh, just putting some certain highlights here. Then he mentioned the, the word Ton, uh, the phrase ton taxi, which is the order, the arranged order. And that's in Colossians 2, 5. This is actually Colossians 1, 25. So what he talks about in, in, in the ton taxi, if you remember, was that we have an arranged order. Arranged order of what? In the context, it was the inheritance. So he's letting people know. See, again, what does churchianity say? Oh, the hope of Christ, the glory, the glory, the hope of glory, Christ within you. And they, they show, a, you know, like a, I've seen this before, like a video of a guy putting on his jogging shoes and he starts like having Christ pump through his heart. And he's like, he, I'm like, no, 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 no. That's nothing to do with what that's talking about. So this is, this is about the, the remember, there's, there's hope and there's the hope. If you're an inheritor of the earthly blessings, of the earthly sphere, of, of the kingdom of, of, of the God, then yeah, you have a hope. But if you have the hope, then you have the hope in the heavenlies. And that's what he's talking about in Colossians. That's why he says remain steadfast. Your stewardship grows, and with it, so does your accountability. And there's an arranged order of your inheritance. So the inheritance will differ, meaning what you will experience as a 30 or a 60 or a 100 fruit person. Obviously, the 100 fruit has been the, the pushing of the earmark in Colossians of the bride of Christ. So to, to mirror that, he goes on and he talks about that there is a, there is an, he mentioned there is an anakano. This is one of the biggest things we saw here in this book to, to kind of tweak our understanding. There's a, there's a renovation a second time as an aniskos of sperma. And so, remember, the renovation initially takes place as a technon down in the sporos, and we never saw two, two renovations before. But there is a second renovation. There's an anakano renovation. So what does renovation mean? It means what you just think you mean. It, it means what you think it means in your own life. We call it spring cleaning, right? Uh, sometimes it's a kind of a, a – spring cleaning is not the same thing as renovating, but it's a little it, – it's a precursor to that. So renovating is doing what? You're changing the inherent structure of something, right? You're renovating. You're, in, you're improving or changing the inherent structure of something. So this is the, this is the word picture of the old and new wineskins issue, right? So Sister Lane and I talked about this before. So the, so the wine itself is the doctrine. So if you were to think about this, Sister Lane and I talked about this before offline this week. So if the wine is the doctrine, the wine skin or it says the patch, the right skin is, is, the, is the framework of understanding. So what he's talking about when he says you're renovated, he's saying he's given you a new wineskin. 
and that new wineskin has to make the old wineskin get, get, get put in context. You don't throw it away. You just look at it in contrast for comparison to remember where you've come from. You never throw anything away God gives you because, because God says his, the gifts of calling of God are irrevocable. And everything out of Scripture is not that good, right? It brings forth a, a, a benefit. So it's just that when you're putting in a new understanding, you have to put it into the new framework. So, for example, um, I may, so somebody may go, oh, look, an Ariston, a Dyson, two different things. Fantastic. Do you know the framework from what, that it, what that's leading to you to, to know? They go, no. Okay, well, then you know a truth, but you don't know the framework from which that truth fits about what's going to happen during that time frame's and why and how that's important and what's gonna and why the different different peoples are involved there, what a foolish and wise virgin really is and what the extra measure is and so forth. So the new wine is the doctrine and the wineskin is the framework of understanding. So when he talks about how you have to anakano, the renovation, it was ironic that Sister Lanny asked me that question earlier this week. It dealt with the reflection that we talked about in the book of Colossians. He's saying, look, as a Naniscos, when I first came to be a 30 fruit person, my framework had to change of how I saw God and his word. Absolutely it did. That was my second renovation. Well, you say, well, how would it change? Pretty simply because I now understand the difference between salvation and inheritance, and I know there's a distinction there. So I can't put the two together anymore, but I knew that early on as a, as a micros in sperma, I heard, I heard that. So as an anisco, not only do I know that, but I know there's actually a negative consequence. So I know that there's a negative reality as well. For there's, a, there's a reward and a consequence at the judgment seat. So I know about salvation and inheritance, and I know about reward and judgment. So there's a framework that's changed. I've also been introduced to the difference between salvation and I mean, sorry, excuse me, sovereignty and free will. I understand that. There's a distinctive difference there. So, and so there's a framework that has to be then, if I see that framework shift, and I don't go back to Scripture and reread what I already thought I already knew, then I'm missing it, that I'm trying to put... The, the old wine and new wineskins. I can't put my old thinking inside a new framework. It doesn't work that way. You can't do that. And so people do it all the time, and they say, well, well that, that's why people who believe in the kingdom things will see sovereignty. They'll see it clearly as day. For example, we're going to get to it later, when Jesus went across the three men who were demon-possessed. Please show me one guy who on his own free will said, oh, I want these demons out of me. Who, 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 who said that? They couldn't say that. They were demon-possessed. The demons were mocking Jesus, but the man possessed had no control of what was going on. But yet, that's why people make fun of Mary Magdalene. They insult her because they're ignorant. And number one, they put her as an adulteress, which is wrong. Secondly, they put her as some, somebody who has some sexual thing with Jesus. Wrong. Then they say, oh, she's just, she's just uh, you know, uh, an ignorant woman. Wrong again. She was possessed by seven demons, and Jesus healed her from that. And because she knew she had no free will. He came around just like, ah. She was like, w w w thank you? And she showed her gratitude so much that she was so close to him. She wanted to hear every word out of his mouth. He was like waiting for the next word to drop. I mean, she was just there. You saw that by her life, by her running to the tomb, by her being the first one he spoke to. And there's a lot of latitude. Even again, don't, don't forget that the early Christian church history says that she was a authority of teaching the church. She was not looked upon as some ignorant human. No. She was looked upon as the most intelligent, knowledgeable women of anybody. Matter of fact, of any person outside of the apostles, she was considered to be very highly esteemed. So for people to say, oh, she's a throwaway, you're ignorant. She's an adulteress, you're ignorant. That's not what it's talking about. Okay. So that just goes to show, but how, how, how did her name even get brought up to begin with? Because Jesus, on his accord, not hers, freed her from demonic possession of seven demons. Seven. Was there a free will involved? No. No. So if you go back and not read that story again, you don't go back and read the story of Jesus and the possessed men again. If you go back and read, uh, read Mary's account again, hail favored one. Yeah, I, I missed the part where she was going, please pick me, please pick me, please pick me, please pick me. I, I don't remember that part in the Bible, do you? No. There was never a part where she said, I read the prophecy and I wanted to be... Please be me, please be me, please be me. That's not what it says. She had no will to, to ask for that blessing. Or one could say that curse as well that came upon her by people ostracizing her from the days of that point for the rest of her life, she'd be ostracized. She would always be known as the adulterous whore who did not have 
a relation with her husband the right way. She was stepped out of her marriage with another person, and she bore a child out of wedlock. As far as they were concerned, she was a whore and a harlot. She had to live with that the rest of her life. A total falsehood, a total lie. She had to keep living with that. So you think she prayed for that? I want to be the one. And the negative that comes with it. And, and the ostracization and the affliction and the pain and suffering. Because I want to be that one. She didn't say that. She never said that. But then when she was told, I loved her response. Be it unto me, Lord. as according to your will. Interesting that she would say, not my free will, your will. Because she knew what I just said is true. If she's hearing me right now in heaven, she'd be like, yes, finally. You know, just stop worshiping her. People who do that are ignorant. She's just a regular human being, but an astutely spiritual, educated human being, very good heart, very good mind to the Lord, but did not have anything different than the rest of us when it comes to verse subjects to God. None of us can move God's hand. We can't do that. That's God does that, right? So anyways, so that's what he talks about renovation. Or the frame of mind has to change. So also we saw, and in, in I'm going back into teaching Colossians again. I don't want to be doing that. Then he also talks about, um, Lastly, he talked, because of this, he mentions, he mentions also um, to walk in wisdom in Colossians. He mentions to walk in wisdom as you've been purchased out of ex ek agarazo as ex agarazo. So that's four or five. That's in that, that passage there. So the whole point about Colossians is, in essence, remember who you are. Remember, remember what's at stake, that there is a, there's a distinction of, of benefit and inheritance. Remember that you have to have your frame of mind changed. And remember, that starts with how you live. How you live reflects. So the framework was given to you to refilter the information so that then you could live differently toward God and human beings. That's what he's basically telling you in Colossians. Yes? said people would then argue that she used her free will to submit to God's will. Ugh. Yeah, true, and they're also, yeah, yeah, Ugh is right, yeah, they're ignorant. It's so, <laughs> it's so, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's like I, when I was in seminary, For just so you know, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before many times, but there's always time to, to repeat this, so it never leaves my brain, that the, the PhD, the degreed man teaching, I forget the course what it was, but he said, and I quote, if Noah did not obey God, then he would have been unsaved and damned to hell. Really? So God calls a man out, and all of a sudden he can go, nah, you suck. Well, wait, 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 wait. But I said to him, wait a minute, Romans eleven twenty nine says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. What do you do with that? Well, that's New Testament. Okay, okay, okay. So God can call a guy, and he can go, I'm not going to obey you. And that makes him hellbound, according to that dude. And I'm like, that's crazy. But not obeying him as a consequence is his kid. That doesn't mean he's no longer what God said he was. God called him to be different than the rest. So whether he lives up to that or not, it's a whole different situation. But they, again, they conflate, or they, because he was a lordship guy, they, they equate obedience with salvation. They're two different things. Two different things. It's just like, again, equating obedience with birth of your child. Anybody who thinks that you have to obey to validate you're the child of your parents, you got, you got to get your head examined. There, there's nothing you have to do to validate you're the child of your parents. It's just called your DNA and your blood type and your birth certificate. That pretty much proves that. And if you were born back in the day, the midwife would testify. She was there. Okay, so, so there's, nothing really you can, there's nothing you can do or not do to prove your child relationship to your parents. It, it just is. And you can do more to validate it, but you can't, you can't disprove it, or it, 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 you can't validate it, I should say. You can't validate it. All you can do is just affirm it, I guess you can say. You know? So it is what it is. So it, 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 it's, it's a valid truth because it, it exists without your consent. There was never a time, and if you want to sit here and lie to me and say you chose your parents, then tell me how that was. Tell me the hours and days leading up to that moment. And also, please explain to me, tell me about the sperm and egg event, how that happened. Tell me what, how, that, how that came into being, how your memory of that was. And also tell me about the memory of leaving the uterus, how you left the womb. Did you spring off your mother's pelvis? Did you actually, do you remember that? And do you remember the doctor's first words to you? Do you remember what his hand looked like? Can you tell me the instruments that they used when they, they took the umbilical cord and cut it? Can you please tell me all the food that your mother ate when you were in the womb? 
So stop lying to yourself and acting like you chose to be a child of your parents. Because if you did, then you should remember all of that. So stop lying to me. No one remembers. You can put under hypnosis. You can't remember that. You can put under all kinds of polygraph machines. You can't remember that because you weren't a part of that. All right. So Epistle of James. That's the next thing we talked about. Epistle of James. And here, I think one of the biggest takeaways on this one was this word parazi. And remember, it means to tempt or test. Because the context, the context determines. And that was a big deal. And that was, what, that was based on uh, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. If one is tempted by God, let no one say that God tempted him, because God tempts no one. But the reality is, is that the word tempt, perezi, Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted in the, wait a second, wait a second. God just said he tempts no one, right? But it says Jesus himself was led to the wilderness to be tempted. Now, we know that's a typology of the inspection before his paschal lamb appearance at his Passover. But the reality is this, that parazi, the reason why it can be misinterpreted temptation or testing is because it's the context from how it's used. Because remember, parazi in its own definition, it means to bring out. So it brings out of you what's already in you. So what's in us? Sin, the man of sin, and the, and the spirit. So if the man of sin brings out flesh and sin out of us, then it proves that it may have started as a test, but it became a temptation. If it brings out righteousness and, and, and holiness out of us, it was a test that we passed. So it's the same word, because it means to, it's to draw out of you. If it draws out of you a sin response, or a sin result, or a sin reaction, then therefore it was a temptation. If it brought out of you the other, a spiritual and godly response and reaction, then it was a test. And so the context determines that. That's why he tested Abraham, to bring out of him what he already gave him, a deposit in his heart and mind and spirit. So he does test us. He tests us. He just doesn't tempt us. But here's the thing. Does God test us one-on-one -on -one with just him testing us? Yes. But we also saw with the book of Job, God can use Satan. Yikes. And when he uses Satan, it quickly turns into a temptation. That's a test that he gives because of the conduit of using Satan. It's now become a temptation because he's going to want to draw the sin out of us. God wants to draw the righteousness out of us but Satan wants to draw the sin out of us. And any test involving Satan easily turns into a temptation if we don't keep our eyes on the Lord. And eventually, it's, it's impossible to keep doing that. Even Job proved only for a time you could do that, and eventually you'll fall. If that is an ongoing onslaught that he proved to you in Job, you can't win that fight. It's not about winning. It's about turning and trusting and believing and entrusting your spirit to God through it all. And so... And that, that's what it's about. So that's the first thing we learned from James. It's a very big takeaway. Lots of takeaways from James. But I'm, again, and Colossians. I'm just highlighting some things. And this isn't everything. I'm just highlighting things. And then also, we talked about in, in James and the difference between the kalos, the kalos and agathos works got brought out. If you remember. And that's the kalos agathos works that we talked about in James chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. And we talked about how the kalos is the inner disposition. He says, well, you believe in God, even you do well. You do kalos. That's an internal disposition. Even demons believe internally. The point is, he says, if you want something to save you from any consequence of God's judgment on your life, then you need to take that kalos belief and act it out with agathos good works. Because the kalos is the disposition from which the agathos comes out of. And that's what he's talking about, the kalos and agathos works in, in James 2, 18 and 19, the most oft confused verses of churchianity because Martin Luther, of course, said it was sifted straw, it shouldn't be in the Bible, right? So there's that about, that about James. Then you have, in James chapter, in chapter 3, he says, the tongue 
is an anarchist. So I love it when people say, um, well, you know, don't cuss, don't swear, don't get frustrated, don't raise your voice, don't use sarcasm, all these things that they'll say, sarcasm, anger, cussing. They'll say, if you, if, you get, if you raise your tone, if you use sarcasm, or if you use a bad words, then therefore that proves that you're not really walking in Christ the way you're supposed to. But here's the problem with that. Um, the tongue's an anarchist. So how do you guys sit here and tell me that you've got that mastered? When scripture says clearly, no one can do that. So now granted, one may have a lot worse of a time frame with, a, a time with that than others. I know I certainly do. I get, I'm an emotional creature, and I get a very big problem with that. It's a, it's a very big sin of mine that I can't control my tongue a lot of times and I get frustrated, irritated, or whatnot. But the reality is that, that you got you to sit here and tell. So people in that moment, people will look at me, particularly church sanity folks, and they'll say, oh, that proves that you're not, you know. Oh, are you serious right now? We all have this anarchist part of our body. Did you have a tongue? Okay, then you too have a part of you that's anarchist against God. And you're going to sit here and lie to me that you've got yours under wraps. No, you don't. You may just not show yours like I do. You may not have it visibly as noticed as I have, or whatever the magnitude, whatever it is. It may not be the same magnitude, it may not be in the same public forum, but nonetheless, you have issues. Don't sit here and lie to me and say you don't have those issues. But I'm not trying to deflect against my responsibility either. I'm responsible for my own sins and to not, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, minimize it. It's still wrong, right? But the reality is that. It, it's even worse when someone gets uppity and high and almighty and gets that sense of, you see, you're doing something that's wrong, as if they're, you know, reproved from all wrongdoing. Then also, we of course, we, we talked about how, um, and James also, he, he mentions that we have to, he mentions to suffer, then grieve, and then we lament. But then he said that leads to joy and laughter. He talked about it. So, in, in, and he's talking about how, again, in, in James 4 and 9 and 10, he mentions how, again, that we're supposed to have both. We're supposed to have suffering and grief and lament, but not for the purpose of suffering, lament, and grief. No, we're supposed to have that for the purpose that that's supposed to lead us to joy and laughter. That we're supposed to then go, wow, through all of that, that time in my life and that, those sins that I just did, have done, am doing, boy, I'm, I'm pretty much not doing a good job of, of loving and serving and honoring God. But then you realize he forgives, he restores. I repented, I turned from my sin, I turned to him. I met to Melamide from my sin. I met to Noia to him. He restores, he, 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 I'm a new man. And you have joy and laughter because you, uh, you're like, wow, I serve a God who's that loving to erase all that away. That is awesome. So you don't lament and grieve and, 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 and suffer just for that sake. You don't stay in that state. It's supposed to lead you to the other. Yes? Uh, first of all, Lainey said, so the meaning when people pounce like that is if they are perfect. And um, Pam said, right, Lainey, and so often tie it to salvation. See, she's not really saved when she acts like that, dumb. And Lainey said, yep, and since you are a Christian, you shouldn't say those things. Why? Yep. Pam said, the plank treatment. Yeah, it is, you know. Yep, 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 yep. De definitely true. People have this, the, this comparison, contrast mentality about Christianity. And then, of he course, yes. um, he, he goes into the last part of James. He says, you know, do not or, or don't defraud don't defraud, um, and it's, it's aspoterio, the workers. And what he means by that in a spiritual context is our job, because we have so much that God has given us, we can't defraud those who are working to get to know God and his word. And if they ask you for something or if they or if they are needing something, it's our obliga we are obligated to, to give to them. We just are. So you can't, if, they're, if God has them ask you a question, 
if God has them looking to you for, for support about something in the scripture, you, you can't defraud them. He uses a practical reality of how people do that financially when they work and then they don't pay them or pay them less than they agree to. That's defrauding somebody. But it's also the same in the spiritual context. He's letting you know that people have got to be able to count on you if they look to you because God's blessed you and given you things that, that allow you to see things differently. And if they come to you for a question or an, an, for a question or an answer to a problem or, or whatever, whether they receive it or not, it's not your, it's not your problem. Your problem, your concern, is to deliver in love the truth and not to defraud them. Now, I'm not saying put the hardcore truth on them like that. I'm saying you gotta make sure that they understand it in the way they should receive it. Yes, God's gotta lead you in how you deliver that message, but you gotta make sure you don't withhold information from people that are working to get to know God. So if you see and hear them and you just don't correct, you have to make sure that if, if like I, I have a person right now that, and at work, assistant at work, she'll constantly come into my office and we have a, this is just a true thing. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. This is true, for example. So we have a two-week meeting, and we go over things every two weeks that are just out there, right? Outstanding things. And reviewing for the last two, upcoming two weeks, and so forth. Projects and all this kind of stuff. At that meeting, she then says to me, hey, can I put at the beginning of the meeting Bible question? What? Sure. I'm not going to say no. So I'm like, sure. Well, now it's turned into, instead of an hour and a half meeting, it's like two and a half hours, which is fine. But it's, it's an awesome blessing because she wants to learn about some stuff, and she's working and wanting to get to know the Lord and reading his word. And, and it's like, that's, that's an example of what I'm thinking about what God's talking about. When someone says to you, I want to learn, I want to ask a question about the scripture, y you can't say no. You can't just go, no, I'm not going to tell you. No, I'm not going to spend time. If they say, hey, I have a question. Can you have time to talk to me? You can't do that. When you guys call me and you call me and somebody texts me, I have to answer you. I, I can't just like, you know, I, I have to answer you. But the reality is when I, when I answer you, I, I don't, but I'm not going to answer. I'm just to just say no. But my challenge is that just being, I'm going to call myself out on this, is that sometimes um, people can ask me questions that are very, very like, you know, broad and very, very like, um, how do you want to say, um, encompassing, encompassing and cumbersome. They're very huge. Like they'll say, what is the, or like, I'm not saying they say this, but so if someone said, what is, the, what is the origin of life and how everything has fit into, you know, all this and this and that and this and that. So sometimes things are difficult. But other times I, I can answer a question that I, I can answer a question, but the reality is that how I've answered it may not be sufficient for somebody. Here's where I'm different. And people must understand this sometimes about me. I'll be, I'm just going to call myself out on it. Sinful or not, I, I don't, that's in God's hands. But when someone asks me a question and I answer it, then they come back and rebuttal me with a rebuttaling, which is nothing new. There's no new information, though. It's like try, like in our court system, you can only retry a case with new evidence, with new information. So if there's not new information and new evidence, it's the same thing you've already presented, and I'm just, I've already answered that, I'm not going to answer it again. Because I don't want to get involved in an argument or a discussion that's going to lead to a fallout or a discourse among brethren that turns south. Because that's what could likely happen. I'm, I'm not into that. I'm into the, I'm not the end of all. I'm just giving forth the answer that God gave me and then I'm done. Unless there's new evidence or seeking to understand what was being said, but if, if what's being presented is just being represented again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't do that because I just don't know how to, I, I myself don't trust myself in that situation to continue to go down a path where there's obviously a disconnect. I just shelf it, leave it in God's hands, and say, God, you guide, I don't know what to do with this, you know, kind of thing. Yes? Pastor, I think you de can't decline when I called, smiley face. <laughs> and then Pam said loaded. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, just getting an idea, but I mean, but so this is a challenge for me. He says don't defraud. It seems like it's pretty easy, don't defraud people, but it's a challenge for me because I'm thinking, how do I not defraud people I don't want to get involved. The Bible says, too, you're not supposed to seek this confrontation either. So I'm just trying to be seeking peace, you know. But cause I know I'm not the end of all this. I just put forth that evidence, and that's it. And I can tell you many examples of how I've done this where I've had some people actually greet me with an animosity after I had given them an answer to the question they asked. No, I definitely am shutting down. I'm not. I'm, I'm done. Or if they don't greet animosity, they come back with something else, something else. I'm like, well, that, that's fine. 
but then it's clear you have, you've ignored that, what I've just said to you. What, that's fine if you want to add some, if you add other questions, as long as they are in an acknowledgement of what I've already told you. But if you're ignoring what I've already told you, uh, the questions you're asking me, it's kind of like it's 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 like I don't know how to answer that question because I've already answered the question previously. If you think about it, but because you've ignored it, you're asking me a different way, the same question, and so now I'm thinking, uh, okay, wh wh what's going on here? You're not you're not asking to learn, obviously, because you haven't learned. You just you just re it's like asking, hey, what's two plus four? And I, I go six, and you go, but what's but what's five plus one? Six. So what's what's so what's 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 three plus what three plus three? Six. But why are they all six? Okay. I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> okay, those are numbers, okay? I mean, it's like, it's like you're just, so it's like people, it's like that. That's what I mean by that. It's like, how do, you, how do I, I don't explain that to you. It just, it just is. But they're not the same numbers. I, I understand, I understand. Two and four, uh, two different numbers, then two, then three and three. I understand that, I understand that, I understand that. But just take a step back and add them up. They both equal six, okay? That's all it is. That's all it is, just numbers, just relax, just facts. They look the same, but they are the same in their net result, yes? Yeah, I had somebody tell me, for example, I could get involved in details. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a reference to something. Somebody said to me, um, this is past and present, by the way, so I'm not pulling anybody out individually. This is multiple people that have done this to me. This is, the, this is the biggest thing, I, this is the one thing I get above all that is, is, is just frustrating to, to me, to me. I'm not saying it makes me angry, it just makes me frustrated. And that is, they'll say, hey, this, this, this word means this. And they'll bring out a word in scripture that means something. And I'm like, that's correct. And they'll go, so therefore, I don't believe this, or I do believe that. And I'm going, based upon what a word means. But the context of scripture has to come into account as well. And they go, no, you're making that up. Okay, when the scripture says God hides you under his feathers, is he a chicken? No. Is he a bird? No. So why does he say his feathers? Is the word feathers mean pinions? Feathers like we know of a bird? Yes. Well, but based on definition of the word, he's a bird. But we know that's not true. Come on, dude. So the word definition itself, my point is, cannot by itself be all that you base your understanding on. Because if that's what you do, that's wrong. You have to take the context of how that word is being used. So there's three ways to understand scripture when people are studying it. They study it from just a cursory view of putting together facts that they see from the, re the, the translation that they're reading. Some go to step two, and they think it's the cat's pajamas, and they go, oh, look at this, I'm looking at what the word actually means. Well, that's great. But you have to take those two steps to the third step, which is now how does the, how does the contextual gathering, the, word that, that the words what they mean, how does that fit into the context of each time it's being used? Because you cannot ignore that last piece. Because if you do, you got God as a chicken, based on what I just said. You got God as a bird, because you can't deny that the word, and, there are, and there's feather, the word feathers is the same feathers used as a bird, it means pinions, and you're gonna sit here and tell me that if the word itself is the, is the, is the end of all of how you study, then, then, then you have to say to me that God's half man, half bird, or he's half bird, or he's bird. You tell me, because I don't believe any one of those is true. But if you're gonna tell me that that's what it wor that word's all that matters, then, then you have to stick with that Conclusion, but we all know that's ridiculous, right? So just take the comp. So there's an old adage in, in Bible study: understand the complex in lieu of the simple. The simple truth is we know, we know, we know God's not half man, half bird. We also know He's not a bird. So therefore, the context of the word itself that says feathers and He hides under His feathers cannot mean the word itself is all I have to count on. That scripture alone proves that's a wrong way to study. All I need is one one evidence that throws away my theory. And therefore I have to take the word itself and I have to also take into account how it's being used. Because what we say, well then, how is it being used? Why would God say that? It's easy, because when a mother hen covers its chicks, you know what you don't see? Any part of it. You don't see the chickadee's head, the feet. You don't see nothing, Jack. She has them all hidden. So what's God saying? I got you. I got you so, no, I'll, I won't just protect you and love you. I'll protect and love you so much that you'll be engulfed within me. Yowza, I want to be under his feathers. Ooh, me, 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 me first. I want to be there. 
That's what he's talking about. That he's got you so, he's so in love with you and me and he protects you and me so much that he will graft us so close to him that the outside enemy and the forces of whatever's don't even see us. And all they see is God's protective love that he engulfs us, just encompasses us, envelops us. Awesome. I'll take that all day long. But that's the context of how the feathers is used to portray that as an image. That, that, see, but if you stick with the feathers as the, all that matters, then you're not going to ever see that. You're going to think God's saying he's a chicken. Okay. So anyway, I digress. Hope that made some sense to those listening. I don't know. Sometimes I go down rabbit trails. Hopefully it <laughs> makes some sense. All right. Uh, first Peter. Uh, and he talks about in Second Peter as well. So he's, we know he's the face and voice of, of Christianity. We know that. Throughout the first century, that's what he was for the first for the first part, and then Paul took over, and Paul became that face and voice. But we know that he re, he reminds us. He has a couple of things. He, he has a lot of things he does. He reminds of of a couple of things of of born of being of reminds us of born again. The Anna. Genesee. Well, now, people out in the world today, I, I love when people say it's an amazing thing to me. Like, I, I, they'll say, I study the Greek languages, and that's one of the things that I'm so en enamored with. And God's got me in a place where I'm growing and learning his, his, his word. And then, so just to see how far along they are, I'm not doubting that statement, I'll just say, so have, have you, when you say that, you say you study the, you mean the Koine Greek. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we studied the Koine Greek. Have you looked at John 3? What do you mean? Well, let me just take a step back. Have you looked at the Gospel of John in itself and kind of scratched your head a little bit and said, you know, wow, the, the word metanoia, metamelamai is not in the book? Does that ever kind of dawn on you a little bit, why that is, you know, repentance? And, and they don't know what to say to me. And then I'll say, have you noticed that the, in John 3, it's not, it's not born again. It's actually born from above. And to see what they say. And they look at me every time. Every time I ask those two questions. Every time the person who claims they're studying the Greek language looks at me like I have a third eye. Like, they, like, like I have a horn in my head. They have no idea what I'm saying. And I'm like, I'm just asking you, because that helps me to, to filter or vet what they're saying. Is it, what, is it just tongue-in-cheek words? Is it, is it true to them, but yet not to the level that they want, um, want, to, want to project it to be? Or is it really what they're saying it is? And usually it's just what they, they want to project it to be. That they're get, or it's, it's, I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying it's a, it's a, they're in a startup mode that because they're so different from other people and church sanity, they look at themselves as being further along when in fact they're not as far along as they might think because those two things to me are pretty, pretty demonstrative things that you got to see. Because then, then the third thing I'll do is I'll step it down. My third thing I'll ask them, once I ask him about, did you see the repentance, uh, metanoia, metamelonai, not mentioned in John? Second thing I'll ask him about is the born again, born from above. And the third thing I'll say to them is, did you see, have, have, you, have you seen the issue of the, the phrasing about um, where he secoded or dwelt, tabernacle amongst us in, in chapter 1, verse 14? And that's why I get a coin flip. Some people do say they see that, which is great. That's good. They, they saw that. And then I'll go, then I'll just test one more further and I'll say, have you seen John 1, 1, about the beginning was the word, the Lord's with God, and the word was a God, it's an anarthros. And then I, then I, I lose more of them again. Some may still understand that, but the, I lose a lot more that way. But again, to me, those are just me vetting out the process when people say things like they say born again. Well, Peter reminds us, don't go by what the world says or what Church Sandy says born again means. Remember what it means scripturally. Remember what it means biblically. Remember what it means spiritually. So what does it mean? It means that you have a new framework with new doctrine in such a way that God's changed frameworks throughout your growth cycle, but he gave you such a demonstratively new framework and a demonstratively new wine that he's caused you to be born again when you bear fruit from that. That means you clearly have gone to at least a Dianea understanding. Of the, of, of the foundational elements of this framework and of this doctrine, that now you've bore fruits from it, and now because of that, that's the evidence you've been born again. Because you're born again, and that, and that reality that, oh my goodness gracious, that you've been given a new framework and, and, and doctrine. 
of what? Of the second seed, of the seed within the seed, of truth within truth. So that's what he's talking about in reference to reminding us of what it means to be born again. Reminding us that we were given a, the, the understanding of what the word secrets mean, the mysteries of the scripture. He's telling us that's not something everybody gets to see. So just remind yourself that everybody is born again. A lot of folks are begotten of Christ. A lot of folks are palingenesied, or they're born another time. That's what palingenesia means. There's other, lots of folks have been anacrinoed, anacrino right here, right? They've been renovated, sure, the first time. A lot of folks have been, have been invited to be born from above. Well, I should say a lot, but a, a few more have been invited from, from, from above, but not as many born again. Not as, not as many. Because that's a big deal, man. So what he's saying is, when, to be born again, you have gone through multiple opportunities of growth. At a level, It's almost like saying, not only are you honors in your grades and your GPA, but your honors in college. But not just college, the, the Ivy League college. Do you understand the gravity of that accomplishment? Of, of, of not you that did it, but God? God alone placed you in a, in a position to, to, as he talks about also in Colossians, he says he gives us the sufficiency to fulfill our inheritance. God graduated us. We didn't graduate. God graduated us. God gave us the degree of not just a high GPA and not just from a higher level of learning, but from, a, from, from the reputable school of all time, Christ himself, the school of the heavenlies. Wow, of the secrets of the mysteries unveiled to you. That's amazing. That's what Peter's talking about. So he reminds us to remind you who you are, right? Then Peter also talks about, um, he talks about, uh, let me see here, let me give you another, um, oh, he talks about the day of inspection. He talks about the day of inspection. And that's in uh, chapter two and verse 12. He mentions that as a reference to the end of day seven, at the end of the Ariston going into the Dipnon. He makes mention of the, the resource and the gravitas of this is to be prepared for that day. Why were you, what's the purpose of being born again? So I can know Jesus. No, no, no. So knowing Jesus at a deeper level, I can then be the most pleasing I could possibly be and have closeness to him and whatever he wants to give out of that, that's up to him. But all I care about is doing the most with what he's given me. And in order to do that, if he's given me the most that I can actually see of him and his word, I better do something with that so when I'm inspected by him in my heart, mind, soul, and spirit, I'm found not lacking. That, 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 that's what it means to be born again. To be so grateful and thankful and rooted in this sense of, wow, I was given so much information about his word and about him. I want to learn more about that. So as you go into that, then he goes into... Of course, uh, then he goes, uh, let me see here also on my, uh, yep. And then he talks about the, the blessed minority that we are. And that's referenced in, in 320 when he talked about how uh, in Noah's day, there were a few people that were spared of Noah's day. And we did the math before, eight people out of five billion. <laughs> that, 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 that's insane. That's insane. If you remember the number, it's like, so the number was, if you remember, it was, um, it was uh, 0 0.000016%. That was the percentage. Yeah, that, that was the, um, that was the remnant percent. So in other words, what Peter's basically saying to you is, if you want to round that off to 1%, have at it. So there's 1% of people that are of the opportunity to be born again, to have a good thing set of them a day of inspection. And he's saying, hey, if you understand what he's writing, guess what? You're one of those people. Live like it. Gosh, wow. That, that's, that's crazy, right? That's what he's talking about in, in First Peter. Then he goes on, and, and lastly, I want to say about Peter, he then talks about how God, uh, First Peter, I, I should say, then he says how God, God orchestrates everything. And that's in 4.11. He says he supplies all our needs to glorify Christ in us, the power of Christ in us. And the word for, for supplying is the 
word that means to orchestrate, to choreagio. He orchestrates everything in your life to bring out the power of Christ in you. What? Wow. So he's telling you who you are, what's at stake, how, how blessed you are to be of the remnant, and that God's orchestrating everything because of that. Don't, you, everybody, everything's orchestrated by God, but even how much more so should you be benefited that you're part of the uh, will of him that's orchestrated and that, my, that few of people that he's going to bless beyond measure? How grateful should you really be? Then in 2 Peter, he goes on and talks about how grace and peace he said grace and peace multiplied to us, right? They're multiplied through knowledge. And that was in uh, chapter 1, verse 2. We talked about that. Someone says, oh, I've, I, I've, I've, grown, in, I, I've grown in grace and peace with God. You just go, awesome. You have more peace with God? Absolutely. I, I feel more reconciled to him, and, 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 and I feel more of his power in my life, the, the grace, God's power to do what he wants when he wants. You say, awesome. So what, 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 what have you learned about him? What, what do you mean? That he, that he loves me. No, 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 no. 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 If you grow in God's grace and, and peace in your life, then you have, have to, required, mandate, ob obligation, cannot lie to yourself or to God or to people and say, that came with no knowledge of him. Liar. Then you didn't grow in God's grace and peace then, did you? You grew in what you thought was God's grace and peace. You grew in what you believed was God's grace and peace. You didn't grow in God's grace and peace unless you grew because of the knowledge of who he is and his word, and then that gave you that. The knowledge of him and his word gives you that. That's what it says. Through knowledge, you have that multiplied to you. So don't lie to yourself, to God, or other people, and say, I grew at peace with God or, 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 or grace, based on what? Well, I, I took this pill, or I watched this movie, or I, had, I went to this cultural phenomenon event. I don't care. What in God's word made you have a growth and grace and peace? Now, that is true. That is sustainable. That is God-led, not man-led. That is, that is truth, not error, that you can count on, right? That's what Peter's talking about there. Then he goes on, and he also talks about in verse 4 that we have, we have the, oh, what did he say? We have God's, he said God's divine nature as a blessing. Speaking of us having a glorified body, speaking of us having a, a transcendency of, of being formless before him. To have him be glorified, his kind of glory is shared with us. That's just amazing. And then he goes on later and he says, then he, then he, left, a, he left an example. Then he talks about, he left an example. Then he, he left example for, for disobedience. And he, did, he does that and he talks about that in chapter 2. But specifically, he mentions that in chapter 2 in, in verse, verses 1 to 6. And then, of course, he mentions that the heavens and earth, all oh, we saw so much of the origins of that from chapter 3 and verses 1 to 8. We saw origins. We saw that he, he left us a he left he he talks he left an example for disobedience through the angels, through the false prophets, and through those in Noah's Sodom and Gomorrah in Noah's day. He left many examples of do not disobey me. At whatever level that you're at, if you're in the heavenlies, if you're on the earth, be bestowed blessings. If you're of the if you're of a few righteous among those who are wicked, if whether you're Lot or whether you're Noah. Do not disobey me. The consequences are damning. He tells you that. He tells you that. He tells you that. He tells you that. So that's why he ends that, that, that chapter 2 and says, it's better to have not known God than to know him and be like a dog turned to the, to the vomit or a pig to the mire. In other words, people always say the question, this is your, that, that's your proof text, by the way. Chapter 2 of 2 Peter, people, always say, the people say to you, well, wait a minute. If, I get this a lot, by the way, from you, you guys as well. You'll say, well, people in Joseph have it pretty easy. 
So in Revelation 14, the, the Mount of Olives opens up, and then Jesus comes there with the, with the grapes of wrath, treading the wine press, and they're all thrown in there, and he just pulverizes them for 75 days, and he liquefies them, and then they're gone. Yep. And you go, well, their spirit and soul goes back to God who gave it. Yep. But they don't, they're not individuals anymore because they're no longer a part, they're, not a, they're, they're a part of back to the energy source himself. They're no longer individuals. So they don't have any distinctive existence as an individual anymore because they no longer have their own bodies. They're back inside him. So you go, oh, that's better off than burning. Better to have not known God than to have known him. What part didn't you, you see? That's why he says that in 2 Peter chapter 2. He makes it clear. That's why he says he left you examples about this. He's not playing with you. You, you're going to have a you're going to you're going to kick yourself for how you're living, knowing what he's given you about him to be true, regardless of how what that level is, whether it's of covenant and testament. Boy, if you know anything about him at all, you you, you better act on it. You, you better act on what you know, because if you do not, you're you're, you're going to kick yourself of how much worse you'll experience your future reality than those who didn't know him at all. You'd be amazed of how starkly ignorant you are to thinking they're going to go to hell <laughs> no, no, no. no they actually have it easy they're getting off easy it's like the old adage when people say i, I remember it, it reminds me of the old adage of, of us old those old true story sport movies when when you see i remember there's a line i forget where it's from but there's a line when the when the guy's trying out the, the these people and oh, i know what it was it was the movie miracle and i remember it, it was herb brooks and, and the true story of this guy herb brooks who coached the u.s hockey team to beat the four-decade standing gold medalist Russian team with a bunch of college kids playing hockey who haven't played together like ever as a team. And he puts them together, and the first line of the movie, again, the movie, he, picks, he chooses about 15 guys, something like that, and, it, and it was like another like 60 that are sent home. And he goes, take a good look, gentlemen, because they're the ones getting off easy. And I'm like, well, they're like, they're like, they're thinking, yeah, I'll show them on the team. And they're like, they're getting off easy, meaning, they're not the ones who have to go through practice and be, be beat you in the shape. I'm going to make you vomit. I'm going to make your legs hurt. I'm going to get you through cramps, late nights of studying, long, long practices. You're going to be winded. You're going to be stretching yourself physically, mentally, more than you ever thought in your life. Yeah, they're getting off easy. That's what God's saying to you. If I'm not working with you independently, guess what? You're getting off easy. And you should. I expect a lot less from those I'm not investing a lot of time and resources with. Why would I expect less from those I spend time and resources with? That makes no sense. We don't do that in real life. Why would God do that? Think what you're saying. So of course he's saying those disobedience, the example he left is to say, where God spends his time and resources, he's going to expect a lot more of you. And don't be fooled to think of the world's mindset of, oh, well, well they're, they're the ones who are soft. They don't, they don't know them at all. Really? Based on what do you, how does that make sense to you? That makes no sense to you if you really think about that from what we've already said and what we read in chapter 2 of 2 Peter. All right? So anyway, the origin of the earth issue, we saw that. That was dynamically awesome. We saw how there was light and darkness, how there was three days, and, and, and how what God, was going, what God was doing there and what that meant about how the earth and its formation, what that looked like, what heavens looked like, and how with the, the true heavens was, was no darkness. It was light. And so the darkness God had on the canvas, he just used it and restored what we saw. But so the new heavens won't have any darkness at all. And the earth, which used not to move and then moved, will not move again in the future. So it's an interesting reality of how it's like, wow. I mean, God showed us so much in, in that origins of the heavens and earth and what will in the future be as that new heaven and that new earth. It's an amazing thing we saw there. We went back to Genesis and saw some insights there. Then we saw first, second, and third John. A lot of takeaways here, if you remember. And here we went into, um, we went into, I love how this, we, the, the, the phrasing, the life, the age lasting. That that was Christ. That he defined Christ as that title. He's not just the life. He's the life, the age lasting. It's amazing. He, he, he mentions this. Then, of course, he goes on to talk about in 1 John. And that's in chapter 1, verse 2, well, verse 2 and 5. And he also talks about light versus darkness and all of us. He talks about that. Light in all of us, there's light versus darkness. 
but that we have to acknowledge that and move forward. We can't just act like it doesn't exist in us. Then you're a liar. He says that. You're a liar. So when I say that out loud, people get, I remember there's just one person and, 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 and they, they, they made a comment about me that was, um, which was an exaggeration of, of something that was not even close to true. And, uh, and I just, my knee jerk, witty sarcasm, I said, and you're a liar. And they got really offended, like a DEFCON 5, like real upset and angry. And I'm like, wait a minute, you just made an insult to me that was actually a lot worse. I won't repeat it. It was a lot worse than what you said. And, and Max, I'll, I'll tell you what she said. She said I was a, I was a bigoted racist. And I'm like, what? I'm like, you have your mind. I mean, no one has ever called me that in my entire life, like ever. Just the opposite, if anything, that I'm, I'm, I'm way too friendly to minorities and people that would call themselves of that culture. No one says that to me, like n no one of, of, of different ethnicities and culture. They, they never say that to me, like ever. So for someone to say that to me was just amazingly ridiculous. So I said, you know, and you're a liar. So when I said that, it was like, that to me was more ridiculous what she, what she said to me. But then I came back with that comment. It was like DEF CON 5. The anger you should have seen was ridiculous. Was, uh, my anger was more of a sense of irritation in my tone. And I said, liar. There was a tone change, a pounding on the, on the, on the desk. There was, a, there was a red look on the face and a stern look. I'm like, whoa. So, oh, the body language changed, the voice changed, and you, had to, you, punched the, you put your hand down on the desk. That's interesting because I had a voice change. My face didn't turn red. I was just disgusted, like, come on, yeah, you're so ridiculous. So it's just, but to me, it's interesting how that he says light versus darkness. Darkness is, it's in all of us. And it's amazing when you call people out for the darkness that's in them, how upset they get. But I know it's, it's amazing. You know, to me, it was like she was exaggerating something about me that wasn't true. And based on some things that whatever she was saying, um, but then, because I, I actually, um, uh, she was talking about, I don't know if she's, I, I don't know what it was. She was saying because I talk to people and I, I take on a persona of the person. So she goes, when I do that, that to, that to her is um, bigoted, bigoted and racist. And I go, no, that's genuine for me. That's not a, I'm not acting. That's a real thing. I'm not acting. I don't like think about it and do it. I just, it just happens. I've done that my entire life. I can remember. I just kind of mirror or, or mimic, mimic the person in front of me. I don't know what that is. If it's a country person, I talk more country. If it's a person who's this ethnicity, I, I talk more like that. I don't know what that is, but I do. I, I can't, I don't have to tell you, that just happens. Whoops, sorry. And I've heard it from my own, I know it's, I know it's true about me and, and innately because I know our own grandson who's seen me more often than anybody else as a third party, uh, Ryan would say to me when he said he was little, that I've always done that. So he's a little person growing up through his years and he's seen me. To him, it's not nothing. It's, there's no difference. It's always the same. It's always that's always been who I was, and who I still am. So, for that that person that re, to to take that and twist it into something that's not, and I point out something else, it just sh shows this whole light and darkness thing. It's it, it's just I reacted in a way that was I was I was I was upset and frustrated. So I made a statement because I, I was purposely saying it to be hitting hitting to the core of the issue, and and boy did that hit resonate with her. And so it was really more of an issue there because, because she does that, by the way. She, she's known for taking a semblance of something and exaggerating it. So if you toss something, you threw it. So if you hung the phone up, you slammed it. So if, if, you, were, if, you, were if you were walking quickly, you were running. If, if you, <laughs> and stuff like that, you know. If, if, you were, if you exasperated, you were angry. If, if, you know, everything was exaggerated, everything. So everything you did was repeated and retold into a different way to dance off a page than what it really was. So when I said liar, that's why I, I didn't mean it from that way. I was so tired of that happening, but it's interesting how her anger, to me, resonated with the truth of that, because I think that internally she knew it was true. Because she does it all the time, but that's okay. But I'll just give you an example of how John talks about we, sh we, we don't need to do that. We can't deny we have darkness. I have darkness in me, I'm not gonna deny it. Yes, I got sins in me. Yes, I have darkness. Yes, I do things that are not right. And if you call it out to me, then that, that's, I have to, but don't exaggerate and lie about stuff. I don't like that. Just tell, there's a lot of things, I always say this as a joke. I say, look, there's a lot of things about me that you can call out. The list is long. You can alphabetize it. You can put it in order of, of the day it occurred. There's a, the li there's a scroll of that, okay? There's a lot to choose from. There's no need to make stuff up. There's no need to conflate things and exaggerate them because there's plenty of hardcore evidence of bad things that I, I do and I, and, I, and I am in my own heart and spirit and mind and in my soul because I'm a sinful human. There's a lot to choose from, 
there, don't miss out on, on, the, on the plethora of my candy store of sins. You can choose from, a lot of flavors there. Why would you make up a flavor that doesn't exist? I don't, that just doesn't make sense to me. It just irritates me. There's so much you can choose from that you can call me out on, but don't make up stuff that's not true. So here's the other thing here. So in, in First John also, we saw, we saw also the, um, he talked about the love, the love and hate issue, the love versus hate, I should say. It, you can't hate your brother and love the Lord. And he talked about this in 3.20, and both the sporos and the sperma. Because he, he mentioned how he wrote, uh, oh, excuse me, that's 20. I got that wrong. Apologize. That's 2, 13, and 14. When he said he wrote you, he wrote you a second time. He wrote to fathers. He wrote to fathers and young men and so forth. He wrote, he says, a second time. So he talks about both sporos and sperma folks need to get this down about loving and not hating. And what did God do? And during this time of study in 1 John, I had a, I had a situation in my life where a very good friend and, and, and person that I spent a lot, a lot of time with, a lot of time with, um, said that, some things about me that weren't true at all, but this different person. And then they said, but I love God and I'll pray for you. But yet the, what they were saying about me was totally manufactured things in their head that they had just come to believe were true. They kept repeating a falsehood that eventually they believed was true. And I, and I never said any of those things or did any of those things. And because they, they, they believe I said and did things that I never said and did, they then continued to say it and say it and say it and say it and say it. So initially, when they first said it, I ignored it and said, I just re re rebuttaled with, you know, a kindness of, uh, I don't know where this is coming from, you know, love you, and as always, appreciate you. And then all of a sudden, that to them was an acknowledgement that I was wrong. I'm like, because I, did, I didn't address the actual issue. I don't address falsehoods. When, they, when, they, when you attack like that, I, I, just only, I can't address that. I, it's, just, it's, too, it's too insane to me. So I just re I responded with kindness, and then I got, doubled down on the issue. And the irony was, when studying in 1 John, it was, it was the phrasing, I love God and I'll pray for you, while they were manufacturing falsehoods about what I said and did, which were not true at all. W uh, it was hard to absorb that. I said, we were going through the study literally on this, and I was absorbing that, which took place over the course of many months, and took place over the entire time we're studying 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. What an irony, you know, as God does that. I don't, it's, that, that situation is, is it's, it's kind of semi-resolved, but not fully resolved, but I, I don't know, we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen with all that, how they really feel, I don't know. I kind of know, sort of, but not really, but it's okay. So then, um, then we also saw from the, the John, we saw that there is, there's a begotten plural, and we saw that with the word, you know, I'll write it out here, did Jejematai. Then we also, and we also saw the same with teleosis. So we saw this, so we saw plural births in John, first, second, third John. Then we also saw, we also saw teleos, nope, if I spell it right. Teleotis. Teleotai, I didn't say that. Teleotai, again, we saw that this, uh, this word for mature, plural. And we saw that for the 30 and 60 fruit. And so these are the big deals that we saw, this plural, there and then of course in the other second and third John we saw in second John he addresses he addresses Mary and she's addressed as the lady but he's addressing her from Patmos and in third John we saw bigotry and discrimination take place because of 
somebody not being Jewish or not being a man. Because of Gentiles and women. There was bigotry. So in Third John, he talks about not don't be bigoted and discriminatory against Gentiles or women. And Second John, he talks about an endearing comment about about Mary. He's writing a letter to to her and the other people. Of, of it's a more endearing letter being written there. So we saw a lot of those things uh, referencing again how how we're supposed to have here. And he just he wants to just I can't. Even, it's not li 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 losing room on the board here. And I'm running short of time a little bit, but so in essence, that's just the takeaways from first, second, and third John. There's again, there's a lot more than that, as we already know. But I think one of the other takeaways was he also mentioned to us in first John, he mentions how blessed we are because as those didn't continue with us, it's because of who who they they were never persons who really had the 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 focus and priority on the living word of God to learn more about him from the written word of God. So the written word of God is the Mia love, and then the protos love is the living word of God, which is how you fall in love with the living word of God because you learn more about him in the written word. So remember, when Ephesus lost its first love, you lose your protos love, Christ, because you become weak in your understanding of the Mia love of the scripture. So you have to first love the written word, which testifies of the living word. So the living words, here's the problem we have. People want to love Christ, apart from learning about Christ. They want to have their, their vision and view and, 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 and just their imagination of what they think and want to believe about him and what Church Andy puts out there on the pulpit. Remember, I sent you the text. You didn't get this, but Joel Olstein, I'm mentioning by name, but God love me. I, God love him, excuse me. I don't mean no harm by this. I'm just putting out facts. He, he charges to sit on the floor to see him speak. Guess how much? Five grand to hear him talk. $4,900, one person, to sit in the front seat. To sit in the nosebleeds, about 200 bucks. It's crazy. It's insane. So I, people listen to, the, to guys like him, and they'll say that's how they form their opinions. <coughs> Others listen to more sound people like a Swindoll or even Billy Graham before he died. God love him. He meant well. Uh, none of those people have 100% doctrinal <coughs> you know, truth on things, but they have, the, they have a solid foundation on, some, on the scripture of, uh, the heart of God, but they want to see about how the heart of God and their imagination of God they take from people's um, teachings of generalizations or they take their perceptions of how God's love or they take a song or whatever and they say that's my perception of God. So that's my love toward Christ is, is a combination of those things. It's, it's based on what I've heard and tradition or something like that. But if it doesn't come from the written word of God, it's, it's a very weak view. But some folks go the opposite pendulum, and they go, oh, I'm going to spend so much time on the Word of God that that becomes their Mia and Protos love. All they do is love the written Word, and they know its language, linguistic, and grammatical, and context, and historical, and all this, but they don't know a hill of beans how to relate to other people or how to, how to take what they've been given and show love back to God by how they treat their fellow man and the rally, the rally that God gave them, which is your immediate family and then those around you. And if you don't, you've got to deal with those dynamics. They're not easy, but you got to deal with them. So, so that, there, there's a combination there. So some go to the deep end and then dig themselves into the word. Some go on this side and dig themselves into their imagination of good feelings. And, it's, and it's, it's the middle that's true. The written word gives you the resource of time spent to then know clearly better how to understand and then fall in love more with who Christ is. Because, because of all that, it, it demands a change in you. That, that's a fact. It, it will demand a change in you. There's no doubt it won't, that it won't. Yes? And you said that is so true. Yeah, and so people just sit there and they, and they get too off the pendulum, either one of those. The, two, the pendulum on both sides is wrong. You, you can't do either, you have to do both. You have to take, but the premise is the Mia word. You gotta start there. And, and so somebody wants to talk about how they wanna follow Jesus, and someone says to me, uh, they wanna follow Christ, or they wanna learn more about Christ. They want, My resolution for this year is to learn more about God. And I say, awesome. And the first question I would say to them is, learn more about God, awesome. What, what, uh, what, what scriptural tools are you using to study? And they go, we talk. if they look at you with a puzzled look on their face, they're aligned to themselves. They're going toward this uh, other side of it where I, their feelings and their emotions are tickled. They don't really mean learning about God's word. What they mean is they're gonna go to more functions and con conferences 
where folks pump them up with good feelings. They're not talking about, so the first question that somebody says to me, I wanna learn about, um, my resolution for 2019 is to learn more about God. Awesome, what resources are you gonna be adding to your library to do that? If they say I already have the resources, awesome. Question two, what are you gonna do differently with those resources you haven't done in the past that's gonna lead you to a deeper understanding of his word? They go, what? I'm just asking. Because if you can't answer one of those two questions, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. Forget me, you're lying to yourself. Then you're lying to God, then you're lying to me. Yes? Lady said Tom and Terry's. Right, this is true, right? Right, that's it, uh, oh, ugh. All right, so in the Bible conference we talked about, of course we mentioned, we mentioned the Book of Acts, uh, a Book of Acts review, we, got, we did that. And that was awesome to see uh, basically the, the life of Paul unfolded as a microcosm. Because the life of Paul is a microcosm of what it is to be in Christianity and what it means to grow from a person of covenant all the way through the Aeneer of Sperma. So the book of Acts, people always think, is the unfolding of how the early uh, believers began when actually it's, it's not. <laughs> it's just the first 10 chapters are about that. The bulk of the book is about showing you twofold. Yes, the beginnings of the origin of the history, but then from chapter 10 on to show you the unfolding of the Apostle Paul, to show you how God, from chapter nine actually, that's when he's first mentioned, from chapter nine on to show you the unfolding of a man who is, to, to, who, is to, who is the epitome of what God intends in all of us who have been given the secrets of the mysteries to be the stewards that we want us to be. This is the accelerated growth that we're supposed to have a, an affinity toward. Like, I want God to have that, but look what came with it. Strife, affliction, hardship, shipwreck, nakedness, stoned to death, right? It wasn't like it came with fanfare and parades, okay? It came with a lot of hardship. So, but that's what he meant, that's what the book of Acts talked about that. Then, then we mentioned, of course, we saw the Theophanies and Christophanies. And that was amazing because we began to see how the physical vestige appearing in the Old Testament was Christ, whereas in a spiritual form or smoke or fire, that was the God the Father. We also saw in the New Testament that that meant that Peter, Paul, Cornelius, and Joseph were the four men that saw a Christophany. They actually saw Christ in spirit form. That's amazing that you don't see that unless you see what we already have seen. So Paul, Peter, Cornelius, and Joseph saw the spirit of Christ. The most profound of all those was Joseph because he saw the spirit of Christ before the spirit before Christ became flesh. For those in the New Testament, that was a big deal. So, big deal. <coughs> He's the only one that saw that. Then we also saw the 12 apostles and we saw from that We saw from the 12 apostles how God calls men of different distinction backgrounds and how they all did a different process and how they influenced different parts of the world, how they died all pretty, pretty much nasty deaths. And they all didn't live very long. And in the last four on the back end, only four lived to see beyond AD 70 of Jerusalem being sacked and being burned down. And then, so you imagine that and you go, wow, you don't think about that. And you think about how there was a big chunk of people already dead by the time John wrote 1 John, and Peter and Paul dying in the same year, different parts of, of, of Rome. The friendships we saw, different apostles being uh, a kinship with each other, Simon the Zealot, a Jew. It's, it's interesting, we saw some of that in the 12 apostles. And then we also uh, saw, again, we looked through the, the doctrinal, we went through the doctrinal st statement, and we talked about that in relationship to how that makes it easier for people to understand more about you know, what we actually believe in in different key areas, inheritance, salvation, uh, you know, sovereignty versus free will, all that stuff of things. So we go through that and really made it a little bit more helpful for folks to have a better acclimation to, to that. And you have that book, and, and now Marilyn has the book too. <laughs> and uh, sorry if it took so long to get that to you. Um, thank you, Sandy, for reminding me to, to give that uh, to, to Marilyn as well. Because I was meaning on doing that, and I kept forgetting, and it's my apologies, but I'm so glad you got that now. And so, but actually, and, and you had the new updated charts too in yours, Marilyn, if you didn't notice, it was all the new stuff, so you're good. So then, then we went to the three accounts of demon-possessed men and we saw the difference between, we had a, we had a brephos, whoops, if I can spell. 
we had a breathless person in sperma. He was the one that Legion possessed. But you also had a Nepios person. Oops. He was a child of a curse. Then we had the Nepios person. Nepios and sperma. Who was possessed. But only mentioned in Matthew. And then he was the child of, of disobedience. So this guy here, so this guy here is likened unto Cain, and he's more likened unto Lot and their type. And so we saw the, that, that demon-possessed man issue and all the things involved. To me, one of the biggest earmarks at the beginning of that story was Jesus who got off the boat and went right there. They didn't like it. They, they said, blah, 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 blah. come talk to me. It, it wasn't like, I mean, I, I don't know where people get this from. This whole, this whole free will stuff, to me, is right out the window when there's just certain stories that just don't make sense. If that is how people come to know Christ, then please explain how this guy came to know Christ and, and how his reality of, how, how, how did he, well, in this case, he already knew who Christ was, but how did he actually have Christ come to him? Did he ask for Christ to come to him and get exercise from demons? No. Nah. There, there was no record of, of that. So it's just amazing to me. And, but those are the two things that we saw, the breathless and sperma. But again, interesting, demon-possessed men, he was, oh, you can't be demon-possessed if you're in Christ. We found out that you can be, but also not just in Christ be possessed, but at a higher level, actually. It's because you are, you are persons who are either those citizens who hate him, like Luke 19, you're enemies of righteousness. That's who these people are, these breathless and nepios people. And you can't hate Christ and be an enemy of righteousness and act like you're not going to have that happen to you. That's going to happen to you. Remember those who were trying to act like they were Paul in the book of Acts? And then they said, cast you out. The demons go, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And they came in and kicked the tar out of them. Remember that? So demons can have their way with people who act like a fool and think there's something that they're not. Yes? Well, we love you, girl, so I'm glad. So, and yep. Pam said, I think we can see that in the Democratic Party. In the Demo Democratic Party. So in, in Psalm 139, but you just referred to breathless and nepious and the third one. There is no third one. No, there was two. There was oh, there's three accounts. Three accounts. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, two men, but there was three accounts, Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so in Psalm 139, when he says, in, in Psalm 139, I want to remind myself, and I just, this is one of the key verses that he says when he is, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we all have that in our minds. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are your works. What it, what it should read is, is that the one who, who, who is fearful and wonderful made us, and that is amazingly, I should say not wonderful, but amazingly marvelous. So that's that's the that's the imp that's the inference behind Psalm 139 that God's in control of it all, and that through it all and by it all, that the one who is fearful and wonderful made us. So the oft misquoted by me, especially mostly me, I always say you're fearfully and wonderfully made in the womb. And that's not true. The one who is fearful and wonderful made you. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that marvelous? That's what is being said, which in which which is an inference. The actual 
the whole microcosm of Psalm 139. The focus is on God. God, 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 God. So how can the sinner be spiritual and not just learn? I know, right? I know, that's true. It's wonderful from conception. Yeah, they think, yeah, they think, yeah, they think sinners, that's a good point. How can a sinner be spiritual and wonderful from conception? Y you can't. But the Psalm 139 was all about how, you know, it's all about all these things that God provides, all the things that God's about, everything about him, and about how man is just the benefactor or the missing out part of the equation. But the point is that we are fearful and wonderful. The, fear, the one who is fearful and wonderful made us, and that is amazingly marvelous. The fact that you were made, you were shaped and fashioned by, by God. It's just amazing. So Matthew 13 and Luke 13, we saw here a distinction between sperma and, and, and sporos and, and the different parts of the leaven and how the leaven was different in each part of that. I myself had often misunderstood, and I got that wrong through many years. And if you remember, we talked about how the leaven was always three measures a meal, and I would always take that as uh, things that were regarding uh, only one type of leaven. There was actually two leavens, one for the kingdom of the heavens and one for the kingdom of God. So we realized, so we realized there was leaven here for the kingdom, leaven of kingdom of God, And then there's also leaven of the kingdom of the heavens. And if you remember, we talked about that. So leaven of the kingdom of, of God, we, we, we mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the free will issue, the, the general mindset, the whole love, love, and no accountability. And then also you go on the side of, um, of the leaven of the other piece of it for the kingdom of the heavens, it's the salvation, plural, births, plural. People don't see multiple salvations and births. They don't, they don't see the entrance inheritance, multiple. They don't see that. They don't, they don't see the day of the Lord, day of God distinction, and how that really would, what that means and what's, it, what's in view there. So these issues of, of the leaven, we saw was a pretty big deal because I never seen it before, and we saw the distinctive difference there in those two passages as well that there's leaven in both, if you will, wineskins, the framework of a wineskin of sporos and the framework of the wineskin of the, of the sperma has its own pros, pros and cons. Yes? I think you said kingdom of God or kingdom of the God. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, it, to be technical, it's kingdom. So it should be Thank you. So it's the kingdom of the God. And the kingdom of the heavens. Yep, so there you go. Thank you, Sister Vicki. To be technically correct, you're, you are correct. Then we talked about Christ's timeline and ministry. <coughs> and we mentioned the whole issue about how he was, it was 2 B.C. when he was born. We talked about that, 2 B.C. it was born. And you take that, by the way, to when he began his ministry. We talked about it was actually, um, say, he was birthed here. Whoops, excuse me. I'm going to say 3 B.C. Um, to Beth. Conceived, 2 B.C., that was in uh, Tishri, birth, and then 1 B.C., um, wise men, visit, and then... <coughs> And then 0 B.C. So you have here, and he returns. From Egypt. And then you have A.D. Well, how you say it, but there's a, because you got to go from 0, you got a 1 to 0. You got, this is actually, you got to count 
1 to 0. Is that I get this. You say 1 AD, I should say. That's what you can say it, I guess. So you can say it because there's, there's 1 to 0, and then 0 to 1, which would be AD1, to your point. That's AD1, yeah. Because you've got to go 1 to 0, and then 0 to 1. So that's, so that's 1 AD, right? Is that right, or no? That is a 0 BC, right, or no? There's an in-between there. I don't know how you would say that. So that's, that's so there's 1 BC to 0 goes down to zero because you have to transfer that over to the AD and then you got the first years AD1 which mean there would be is that right? Am I doing that right? Am I saying that right? Jim said technically yes. So one and then zero and then Vicki said Yeah, you can say, I'm just going to say AD, AD zero. I'm just going to say that. How about that? I, I don't know. I, I don't, but the point is, you return from Egypt to here, and then you have AD 29 began ministry. That's zero AD. Yeah. This is in 